You can have a seat, church. Good morning. Hey, if you're visiting for us for the first time, we have a Connect card we'd love to get to know you, answer some questions you may have. We have a connection table where you can go online, uh, but that's there for you. It's a, a robust card form, and you can do all kinds of things. You can sign up for our announcements. You can be prayed for, uh, prayed with, uh, and we answer some questions about who we are, what we do, and uh, why we're here. So thank you for being here this morning, and uh, it is a great week. I was talking this morning um, to one of our team members, just saying, I love the timing of Christmas this year. Like, I think the timing's perfect, in my humble opinion. Like Friday night, we had an amazing worship service preparing for Christmas, Christmas Eve service. So it launches us into a day focused on Christ, which should be a day of worship, and then the following day, a response of what Christ did in continuation of worship, a weekend of worship, a, a Christmas weekend. I remind you, it's like my own birthday. We call it my birthday week, right? Uh, so we had a Christmas weekend, uh, just a lot of fun. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I hope you do, you can turn to Matthew chapter 2. We're finishing our series called The Light of the World. The Light of the World. If you're taking notes, you can title this sermon, The King Has Come, Now What? The King Has Come, Now What? And so that Christmas is really an amazing time. We are celebrating the biggest miracle ever. And some of you will be like, well, what about the resurrection? The biggest miracle ever. And no, I'm not talking about you surviving your family yesterday. That's not what we're talking about here. The biggest miracle ever was God with us. Because when we understand that God was with us in Jesus, then the resurrection makes perfect sense. Because anything's possible. Of course he would conquer death, conquer the grave, pay the price for our sin, conquering those things forever, freeing us from the bondage of sin, freeing us from ourselves because God is with us. Of course the grave can't hold him. Men can't conquer him. No plan of his can be thwarted because God's with us. It changes everything. That's what this December has been about is remembering God with us. And then his kingdom is with us. And that's what we're going to really look at this morning so now that Christmas is over, now what? Because I think we build up all this time for that one day, and then after Christmas, it feels kind of like, now what? Now what do we do? I can tell you, I, I love Christmas so much that I would hate it to be over the day after. It was almost like, for me, it was a mourning period of sorts. Just because I, I hate for it to be over, that, that just season, I hate for it to end, which would lead us, and still does, by, just because of family tradition's sake, the day after Christmas we would take down all our Christmas stuff. It's over. We're done. Let's move on. I uh, know some of y'all are like, I leave myself up till March. God bless your ministry. We do not, right? We don't. But now what? Well, we're going to see a familiar passage, but I think the Lord will reveal some new truths into our lives this morning. He did me this week, so it's been really encouraging. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says this, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, of Judea, in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw the star at its rising and have come to worship him. I just want to touch on a few things here. One, the wise men. Now, I'm pretty confident that many of your nativity scenes, those who have those up, have three wise men and they were at kneeling or something standing next to baby Jesus in the manger. Oh, that's false. You all know that, right? It's, it's all false. Maybe. Let me clarify. The Bible doesn't say how many wise men there were, right? We assume three because three gifts were given. But there was probably at least a pretty big entourage that accompanied this wise man journey. Because they came from a pretty far way away. They came from the east. And so he traveled a long way. So it would probably have a pretty big entourage. And we see here in a minute that it was noticeable. They drew attention as they entered Jerusalem. But it's interesting that the reason they came it says they saw a star. What does that have to do with anything? One, we see that they probably had some experience studying the stars, astrology. But they had an awareness to what the prophets had said about this coming king, Messiah. A lot of people think they go back to Balaam's prophecy in Numbers 24, 17, which says a star will come from Jacob and a scepter will arise from Israel. So these Gentile people 
right? There's two groups, just generally speaking, Jews and Gentiles. God's chosen covenant people and everybody else. We got that? It's kind of what we see in the Bible. So we see these Gentiles coming a long way to see if this prophecy was true. And they say this, born king of the Jews. Where is he who is born king of the Jews? This is noteworthy for us this morning. Jesus didn't become king. The king has come. Make sense? Jesus didn't become king. The king has come. And that changes everything. Psalm 103, 19 says, The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. His kingdom has been established, has been ruling, and it's over everything. Past, present, future, eternity to eternity, forever, will not change. So Jesus wasn't born into kingship. He had always been king. And so why? Why were these wise men looking for this baby? To worship. So let's say, to worship. And I think there's two noteworthy things that we can see here. One, Jesus would be worthy of worship far before he would do any miraculous thing. Jesus was and is and always will be worthy of worship because of who he is was, and always will be, king. When we see Jesus' earthly ministry, we see him doing a lot of miracles, a lot of just fantastic things. And he would attract a large following because those that follow want him to do something for them. Right? What's he going to do next? Either entertainment factor or I need something from you. So he would attract a large following because I need something. And what we see in the scriptures and what we need to remember is Jesus didn't come to develop a following, but rather to develop followers. And there's a difference. We don't come to Jesus to get stuff. We come to Jesus to get Jesus. Because he still is king. So we see that here. Number two, what's noteworthy is wise men worship. I'm just going to let that land wherever it does. Wise men worship. And what we see here is a contrast. These wise men seeking to worship Jesus contrasted with an unwise man seeking to worship himself. Look at verse 3. It says, When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him. Because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. Because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Quoting Micah 5.2. But notice, why did King Herod call for these religious leaders? Because he was deeply disturbed, distressed. We see... Herod's great love for himself, his great love for him, his stuff, led him to great worry, anxiety, fear, stress. You see, he's fearful of losing his kingdom, his power, and his prosperity. That's what it was. Self-preservation mode kicked in. It leads me to wonder, have you ever experienced stress? Worry, anxiety, fear. And the question I have for followers of Jesus is why? Why? I want to let that soak in for a minute. Why do you stress? Why do you worry? Why are you anxious and why are you fearful? If you're following Jesus, and I wonder if it's because you and I Get so wrapped up, pun intended, Christmas time. Get so wrapped up in building and protecting our own kingdom and don't realize it's his kingdom that matters. You see, we all have this power struggle I'm convinced of. We all have just a little bit of control freak in us. Some of y'all more than others. Don't start pointing. We do. We have this power struggle 
And at some point or another, maybe right now, we've all been guilty of pursuing prosperity, that American dream mentality, more, more, and all costs to advance my own kingdom. And it's interesting, as I've been focusing and really focusing on God's word, it's been apparent to me that there's a, a term that I use a lot. And as I've realized it myself, I think we use it a lot. And it's busy. If I ask you right now, how was your weekend? It was busy. How was your week? How was December? Busy, right? I've been saying it a lot. Man, I'm busy, and I'm busy. But it almost has become more of a badge for boasting. Now, let, let, follow me here. If I were to tell you, when you asked me, how was your week? Well, I was relaxing. I didn't do a whole lot. One, you'd be like, oh, that's good. You probably need a break. Good for you. If you ask me next week, yeah, I didn't do much. Pretty relaxing. Wow, that's awesome. Two weeks in a row. Good for you. If you ask me week after week, and I say, yeah, not a whole lot. At some point, you'd be like, what are you doing as a pastor for this church? Like, do you do anything? Right? But the point is, we are busy, but we make ourselves busier than we need to be. And we get wrapped up in our busyness. And our busyness, usually, if we f follow the flow as to why, it's because we're trying to build our own kingdoms. We're trying to have our own prosperity, our own comfort. Man, I, listen, I enjoy some comfort just like you do. But man, how those things can become an idol in our life. How those can become our object of worship if we follow where we spend our time at and our energies and our resources. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus tells those who would follow him, don't worry. You remember this? You see, many of us know these words that Jesus gave, don't worry. But I think we don't know the why behind the what. This is key for us, I think, this morning. Because we've got to know the why behind the what. The what comes from Matthew 6, 25. Jesus says, therefore, don't worry. Don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, drink, your body, what you're going to wear. Don't worry. Well, it's easier said than done, right? Let's just be honest. Because we don't know the why, I think, behind the what. This is the what, don't worry, but why? The key is therefore, right? You've got to look back and see what Jesus says before he says, Therefore. We see in Matthew 6, he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break and steal. But rather, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break and steal. Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, don't worry. Don't worry about your life. But what follows that don't worry, I think is even more important. In Matthew 6, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Why do we worry? Because we seek our own kingdom and not God's kingdom. It's our kingdom and then his kingdom second. If we flip that, it would flip our mentality and how we pursued everything in our life. And if we understood that God is king now, Jesus is king now, he's working now, has authority now, and that will never, ever, ever change, regardless of your circumstances or what you go through, it changes how we see things. How can we rejoice all things? How can we give thanks in all things? It's because King Jesus is still King Jesus, and that will never change. The bottom line here is your kingdom conclusion drives either faith or fear. What you believe about the kingdom drives whether you have faith or fear. In Mark chapter 1, we see in verse 14 that Jesus came proclaiming the good news of God in Galilee. But in 15 it says, he says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news, the gospel. The kingdom of God has come near. That there would be one that would come, a conquering king, who would finally and fully free his people from sin's bondage, finally and fully satisfy the weak sacrificial system that was put in place to temporarily forgive sin, 
that would be abolished and fulfilled in Christ Jesus. This is why when you sin, you don't have to go kill little Fluffy or Spot. Because Jesus fully and finally paid for your sin and mine and supplied when you believe he did that. The moment when he was hung on that cross, breathing his last breath, saying, Tetelestai. If you know one Greek word, let it be Tetelestai. It is finished. Paid in full. The sin debt that you couldn't pay, he paid it on your behalf, in my behalf. Because sin has consequences. And the consequence of sin is death. That is a separation from God that will last through eternity unless Jesus pays your sin debt. Romans 6.23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. But praise God, that's not where that sentence ends. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord, our King, our Master, our Messiah, our Christ, our Savior. There is no one under heaven to which anyone can be saved. It is the name of Jesus in him alone. He says, the kingdom has come near. This is both a who and a where. The king has come who is over his kingdom, right? The king who was, is, and always will be. And I've been thinking about this illustration, and maybe it'll fall, sh- fall short, but I can- can't shake it. Now and later candy. Anyone ever heard of now and later candy? It's not real popular anymore. It used to be. You know, I like to see, like, how do people get names, and how do they name certain things? Now and later candy was named because you can enjoy it now and later. Yeah, pretty earth-shattering stuff. But when I've been just meditating on God's word here and the relationship that we have with Jesus and his kingdom is both a now and later truth. His kingdom's now. We can enjoy his kingdom and his presence now. But his kingdom is also later when it'll be fully established. You can be kingdom citizens now and later. Enjoy it now, being fully realized later. If, Jesus says, repent and believe. Repent and believe. This is an invitation to transfer your citizenship. And what we see here is that repent and believe are not two separate things that are tied together. You cannot repent unless you believe. And if you believe, you cannot help but to repent. Because when you see Jesus and his love for you and for me, how can you not be faced with all those things where you've gone astray and turned away from a God that loved you so much to where he died for you? And I think we get so numb to that truth that it hardens us to the sin's bondage in our life and the severity of it. Like Jesus took your place. You deserved, I deserved to be on that cross. But he stepped in and bore God's punishment for sin so you and I wouldn't have to. Philippians 3.20 says, For all those who believe, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. You're no longer citizens of this mess that we live in. Praise God. There's a better kingdom coming. And we're citizens there now, and one day we'll be present. Which goes back to Christmas. I'm convinced Christmas is a great commemoration that the king has come, but it should stir two responses in us who believe. One, this great commemoration should stir a great anticipation in us. Hebrews 9, 28, 28 tells us, So also Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. What you see here is a now, your forgiveness of sin, but your salvation will be realized later at Jesus' second coming appearing. A now and later reality. And when we see him coming later, Jesus' first coming, his first advent, is a reminder of his second coming. 
And it won't be the eight pound, six ounce baby Jesus that we all know and love. Lying in a feeding trough. Humble, meek, mild, silent night, holy night, right? It's not going to be that when he returns. Revelation 19, Revelation 19 11, John has this vision of Jesus' second coming. He says this, And I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse, and its rider is called Faithful and True, and with justice he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him on the white horses, wearing pure white linen. A sharp sword came from his mouth, so that he may strike the nations with it, he will rule them with the iron rod. He will also trample the winepress of the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, the King of King and Lord of Lords. This is a Jesus that will be returning. But this is Jesus that exists now. Always has, always will, now. Both now and later. But what we see here is the beauty of this. For all those who would believe, God is in the business of making all things new. At the moment you believe that Jesus paid the price for your sin, died and rose again, doing something that you could never do, the Bible says you are a new creation, made new in Christ Jesus. But what it also says is that God's in the process of making all things new. One day, all this that we see around us will be made new. Revelation 21, 5. 21, verse 5. One says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. He will bless his peoples, and God will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more to grief crying, pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. What we see here is a great reality stirs a great anticipation for Jesus to come again because of the great brokenness that we see in the world. I don't know about you, but there's days I get tired of my body hurting. And the older I get, the more real that's becoming. I can't even jump on trampolines anymore because I get sciatica. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is crazy. Then look at our world around us. Broken. And we get tired of the brokenness. Physically, we get tired of the brokenness around us. Spiritually, seeing people get hurt, people hurting others, I get tired of it. I can't even hardly watch the news anymore because it wears me down. The brokenness becomes unbearing, which leads many to cry, come Lord Jesus, right? Like, help us. Get rid of this. So why hasn't he returned? I mean, we see, Jesus says things are going to get worse before things get better, right? Before he returns. Man, why hasn't he returned yet? Well, 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us, The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. So I think we should switch our cry from come Lord Jesus to as long as you don't come, we will endure. Because we see his patience is actually his kindness. Not wanting any to be separated from him for eternity. Because once he comes again, things are done. There's no more second chances. But really, I think we operate on things or second chances. Like I'll have more time to do this or do that. Like we think we're guaranteed tomorrow. We think we're guaranteed lunch after this service ends. We think this service will end. I mean, God could come in reality right now, right? Let's just be honest. Are we ready for that? I think we lose track because we get so busy. We forget about King Jesus. There's a reason why at the moment of faith, you're not bottle rocketed out of here into heaven. You ever thought about that? Like why wait until later? Why can't I have God's kingdom now? Because you got a job to do. So we see in Christmas is a commemoration which stirs a great anticipation, but it's a reminder of the urgency of the Great Commission. At least it should be. 
You see, in Acts 1, we see that after Jesus was killed, crucified, buried, dead for three days, rose on the third day, conquering sin and death fully and finally, he wasn't either bottle rocketed in heaven either. He walked the earth for another 40 days. You guys realize that? Acts 1. Check it out. It's pretty cool. It's in the Bible. You can read that stuff. Wild. 40 days. But there's this point where his followers were walking with him. And in Acts 1 verse 6, they ask him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? Is this it, right? Fully and finally, is this going to be the time? And Jesus replies, it is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. None of your business. I don't know about you, that, that hurts some pride, doesn't it? None of your business. But you, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I don't know if you know this. This is crazy, but witness, witnesses, you know what they do? They actually share about what they experience. You guys know that? Isn't that crazy? So what's Jesus saying? You go and tell the world that King Jesus has come, that he seeks and saves those who are lost and are currently separated from him. There's salvation in no one else because the kingdom is now and is coming in a very full way and the time is urgent. Which goes to the Great Commission in Matthew 28. We recite it every single week and go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to deserve all of command you, and lo, I'm with you even to the end of the age. Why? Because when the end of the age comes, when Jesus returns, time's over. I want you to feel the urgency of what God's calling us to do, to be witnesses. And this scene gets even crazier. In verse 9 of Acts 1, it says, After he, being Jesus, said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight, while he was going up, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way you have seen him going into heaven. In other words, get to work. There's work to be done. There's souls at stake. There's people's eternity in jeopardy. And what I'm reminded of here is that there are many, many Herods out there who are missing the kingdom because they're so focused on building their own. Go back to Matthew 2 with me. Because we're going to close here in just a minute. I want you to see this in verse 7. So here the wise men came, he says, Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men, and asked them the exact time the star appeared. And then, get this, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report him back to me so I can too and go and worship him. What a good guy. What's he trying to do? He got information from God's word, which is amazing, Micah 5, 2, about where the Messiah would be born at. He passed information on to the wise men who were generally looking to worship him when his motives were not. He wanted to protect his kingdom, so he's going to kill that little baby to secure his prosperity, power, and kingdom. Which reminds me that God works all things for good. For those who love him are called according to his purpose. All things. That's a lot of things. But we see here, evil intentions led people with pure intentions in the right way. And then Verse 10 tells us, when they, being the wise men, saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshiped him. Posture matters. Do you know that? It does. Like, reverence for God matters. When you understand how holy he is and how we are not how could you not do anything else but to fall on your knees and worship because of his goodness and grace manifested in Christ Jesus? But this is what's interesting. Jerusalem, roughly about six miles away from Bethlehem. Six miles. Pretty close compared to what the travel that these men have already taken. So 
So about six miles away, notice in this passage who goes and who does not go to see this baby. Who goes? The wise men. These wise men, these Gentiles that would travel from far away, sacrificing their time and comfort to worship King Jesus because they heard the good news that the king has come. Again, wise men worship. They go. Who doesn't? King Herod and the religious leaders. Don't you find that interesting? The people who knew the scriptures front and back knew exactly who to look for, where it's going to be at, the signs of the times. And even when these men said, hey, man, we're looking for the king that has been born, they said, yeah, we know who, go over here. And they failed to go. I don't know about you, that, that, that strikes me. We can have so much knowledge about Jesus and miss Jesus. Being so close in proximity and totally miss the king had come. And I'm reminded here, it doesn't matter if you're 6,000 miles away or 6 miles away, separation is separation. It doesn't doesn't matter how much you know about Jesus, how many Bible passages you can quote. Praise God. Do you know him? Like, do you trust him? Do you believe? Because belief changes your daily walk, your daily attitude, your daily trust. Belief changes your kingdom perspective. It's no longer about you. It is all about King Jesus because King Jesus effectively made it all about you in his death, burial, and resurrection. This is crazy. He did it for his own glory. Don't get me wrong. But because of his motivation being pure in love and for his glory, man, do we receive the benefits. I think we lose this. And so Christmas is over. Now what? Well, again, I think life with Jesus and his kingdom is like now and later candy, right? Now, it's a now thing for those who believe. Isaiah 9, 6 tells us, for a child will be born to us and a son will be given. Which John three sixteen tells us, for God so loved the world this way that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish and have eternal life. That's a now thing for whoever believes. That's a lot of people. It didn't say if you do this, if you look like that, it's whoever. And we say this a lot. Come with your baggage, your background, your belief systems, and surrender them to the feet of Jesus and let him change everything else. Now you can have eternal life. And it lasts forever. New life now that lasts forever. That was given to you. My son Zeke, my four-year-old, this past week, talking about Christmas. And he said, Christmas is everyone's birthday. I said, Really? How's that, buddy? Because it's Jesus' birthday. I want you to follow this. In John 3, Jesus is having this conversation with Nicodemus, a religious ruler. Jesus tells him, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Christmas is everyone's birthday for those who believe. I've been born again. So tell me how much gravity Christmas can create in your life. The newness of life that's offered in Christ Jesus, being born again. We're celebrating Christ's birthday because he's made a new birthday available for everyone who believes. It's a now and later aspect. But what about life without Christ? There's a now and later to that as well. Man, you may be enjoying some good things now, but you know as well as I do how fast those good things go away. And it just drives the desire for the next thing that fulfills that desire that can't be fulfilled. You all know this. You call it what you want. Whether it's more stuff or more things, we have this desire that will not be fulfilled and it drives desire that drives desire. So it's now and then later and now and later. And ultimately, you're now seeking your own desires and your own kingdom will lead to a later completely missing the Savior of the world, the King of kings and the coming kingdom. And you miss the hope that surpasses everything that we could ever hope in, the love that surpasses everything that we'd ever experience. We miss all that because we're seeking the now in our own desires. When Jesus says in John 8, 
12, and this has been our theme verse all of December. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. My question is for you, are you following Jesus? Are you following him? Is your faith in him alone for your salvation of sin? Do you believe that somehow, some way, Jesus on the cross paid for your sin? So that if only you believe that he did that, it's applied to you. You are counted as righteous because Jesus was righteous on your behalf. See, God created all people, everyone, in his image with the purpose of having a relationship with him. But then people stepped into the equation. Sin. We sin. And sin separates. And sin cannot be forgiven or erased by anything good you do. No matter how many gifts you gave yesterday, no matter how much you served this week, cannot erase your sin debt. That's why Jesus lived a life that you and I could not live. Blameless, perfect. To die the death that we couldn't die. That is to pay the penalty for sin, satisfying God's wrath fully and finally. Conquered the grave, rising on the third day, showing that payment was received and accepted so that everyone who believes has eternal life. Right now, and later. Do you believe? Listen, every Sunday we ask you to respond. So I'm going to invite our band up. And we're going to respond in worship. But that response looks at a variety of ways. First and foremost, I want you to respond what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life right now. So only one teacher here in the room right now, and it's the Holy Spirit. So maybe your response is standing and singing praises like our band will lead us in here in a minute. Maybe your response is to sit and to pray. Praying for repentance, for forgiveness, praying new commitments. Maybe God's shown you something that needs to change. Maybe it's falling on your knees right where you are and just worshiping. Maybe for the first time you've seen that you've known a lot about God and totally missed God. You can receive new life in Christ right now, wherever you are, whoever you are, because of what Jesus did for you, if you believe. So we're going to respond. I'll be over the side. I'd love to pray for you, with you. We'll have a prayer team over there. We'd love to pray with you, pray for you, but we desire for you to respond and be obedient to what God calls you to do. And here's the crazy thing. God can be just pricking your heart right now. But we have this concern about what people think about us. Isn't that crazy? So some of you know you should be kneeling on the floor, but you won't unless you are obedient to the Lord because we get so wrapped up about what other people think. I'm not saying, I'm not the one telling you you need to. I'm telling you, you respond to what God has for you and what's called you to do right now and let that response propel us into a new day, into a new week. However God's leading, I ask you to respond. So let me pray for us. I invite you to pray with me. Father, we're so grateful for you bringing us here this morning. You giving us the reminder of how amazing you are and how much we need you the reminder that we are fully dependent on you. Lord, show us how you would have us to respond to your word this morning. Both stir us now and propel us into a new day, desiring to walk worthy of your calling. We thank you for your goodness and grace in Christ Jesus. And Father, I ask that you lead us as we continue to worship you this morning in this day set aside for your worship. And let every day start with us setting it aside for your worship. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. On behalf of the Way Church, 
Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. As a church, we desire to come alongside you on your faith journey to encourage you, to equip you, and to pray for you. So right now, would you let us know what God's doing in your life? You can go online and fill out our Connect card at thewaychurchrva.com. And for those who want to continue worshiping through giving, because we believe that giving is out of a heart of worship, you can do so securely again online at thewaychurchrva.com. And so church, let's go and continue to be the church and love God, love others, and make disciples.